Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our um, panel of the day. I think it's actually the first um, panel. Ecologies of Empire and Imperial Ecologies. Sounds appropriate for our conference today. And um, we're going to have uh, four panelists. A little bit of time for questions at the end. And the first is John Antonacci, Liebenstrom is Ecological Project, World Ecology and Nazi Environmental Ethics. Um, thank you for coming to this session. I'm really excited to be a part of it. Um, so this was a project that I um, was working on at the end of my MA at the New School for Social Research. Um, I'll be starting in the fall at SUNY Binghamton as a PhD student. Um, so today I'd like to sort of provide, not that it necessarily needs it, but some further evidence that Jason Moore's point uh, yesterday morning that killing Nazis is good ecological praxis uh, is, a, is, is good. So um, I had a couple of different motivations when uh, thinking about this paper, um, one of which was thinking about a dystopia, but not necessarily particularly the capitalist dystopia. I wanted to think of um, uh, dystopia within like a multitude of historically specific regimes of sociological accumulation. Um, I also wanted to find an example of dystopia that uh, works through critique of modernity um, and through critique of Cartesian logic. Um, so I, I essentially wanted to find a, a case where um, it, that, that it would serve as an example of where a critique of modernity and a critique of the Cartesian ontological categories and na of nature and society have gone wrong. Um, because I think we need to be uh, careful about how we um, sort of think about the future and think about a post-capitalist society. Um, because it's been discussed a few times uh, during this conference already that we're in a moment of uh, political potential. Um, and we're also faced now with the rise of, of eco-fascism. Uh, eco so we need to sort of be careful about the way we uh, approach um, thinking about praxis, at least. So. Um, the thesis of the paper is that uh, Nazi environmental ethics postulated a, a, an early, it's an early example of a postulation of a move away from Cartesian binary ontological categories of nature and society, uh, and that they attempt to supplant uh, this formulation with a new Cartesian formulation, the friend-enemy relation. Um, so the idea is that just as capitalism requires a binary logic to externalize in order to appropriate, so too does a national socialist political economy uh, require a binary externalization. Um, so I went uh, forward with the idea that social and therefore political movements require some sort of claim of moral superiority to gain salience. Uh, so how do uh, the Nazis form this claim um, of moral superiority in the context of environmentality? Um, so. Uh, Jason Moore has a paper uh, about confronting the popular Anthropocene towards the ecological ethics of hope and care. Uh, so I wanted to juxtapose that against what we might be able to term like an e ecological ethic of hate. Um, so I, I, I um, looked at two Nazi thinkers, uh, Martin Heidegger, who represents a sort of uh, moral justi justification for appropriation, and Carl Schmidt, who was a Nazi jurist. Um, and he, so he represents sort of a legal justification. Um, and then I want to point towards a way that we can understand these ontological shifts within the context of uh, Nazi acquisition of Lebensraum, or living space in Eastern Europe uh, during the Second World War. Um, so I'm going to start with Heidegger. Um, so Heidegger, writing in Being in Time and in other places, such as the, the Black Books, uh, sort of attempts to moralize the act of being <coughs> or dwelling in a space. So his essential philosophical concept, Dasein, or being there, has at its core a spatial element. Um, so uh, Gl Florian Glosser writes that Dasein is encountered in a spatial, environmental, or regional context. Uh, here I said, in rejecting Cartesian logic of objectification, measurement, and calculation, Heidegger privileges nearness and ownness over remoteness and foreignness, cultural homo homogeneity over heterogeneity, and therefore privileges an intersubjective meaning uh, that comes from the same concrete context. Um, so this privileging of the near over the far results in a community connected to a specific place uh, with the, the Volk, the German people, as a decisive political agent with a fundamental 
uh, requirement to find the enemy, to expose the enemy, or even to first make the enemy. And you'll see that Carl Schmitt also talks about uh, the friend and enemy. So Grosser writes that it's, it's thus then implied that this enemy, and who could it not refer to if not the German Jews, quote unquote, improperly occupies a place that it does not originally belong to, and that the Jews, as contrasted with Germans, are described as quote unquote, worldless, deficient, negative, and are characterized in Heidegger's words as Semitic nomads or perpetual wanderers. Um, so this sort of uh, characterization of space offered by Heidegger uh, sort of facilitates othering and exclusion. Um, so for Heidegger, space and its associated uh, environmental content and community, uh, so environmental content is sort of the natural and community is sort of the social, are not necessarily separate ontological categories as portrayed by Cartesian binary thought. Rather, he's sort of trying to move beyond the Cartesian dualism in terms of nature and society uh, and advocate for some novel binary uh, formations such as near versus far, familiar against the other, um, in which there is stressed a fundamental connection between uh, community or sociology and environment and place, uh, of course, based on the exclusion uh, and othering of uh, Jews from Germans. Um, so Carl Schmidt uh, is next. Um, he was a top Nazi jurist. Uh, for those of you that don't know how important Carl Schmidt was to the Nazi project, there were two like main speakers at the Nuremberg rallies, Hitler and Schmidt. Um, so. Um, in, in the very, so he writes this book called Land and Sea, World Historical Mediation. Uh, and on the very first page of the book, he's already stressing the fundamental connectedness of their humans to their environments, uh, writing that the earth appears as the great mother of humans. Um, he then goes on to characterize different peoples as elemental, their existence as elemental. Uh, he says that the human receives a particular historical consciousness from his space, which is subject to great historical transformations. Um, he then goes to say that if the human being were nothing other, he doesn't have a, a deterministic concept though of uh, humans connecting this to the environment. He says that if the human being were nothing other than a living being completely defined by his environment, uh, then the human would be accordingly a land animal, a fish animal, or, or some fantastic mis mixture of these elemental designations. That is, uh, that the human is a being which is not completely taken up with his environment. Um, he then says that the human being is though uh, capable of choice and in certain historical moments, he can even choose the element in which he determines himself as a new collective form of his historical existence through his own deed and his own achievement and the element in which he organizes himself. Um, so in thinking about these great uh, historical transformations of, of spatiality, Smith pits uh, land powers against sea powers arranged into this same as Heidegger, this friend-enemy competition for global hegemony uh, and argues that the notion for the notion that global political power is fundamentally connected to uh, environmentality. Um, so for Schmidt, world history is the battle of sea powers against land powers and of land powers against sea powers. Uh, he casts the English historical experience as ideal typical for what he does, a planetary spatial revolution. Uh, so the idea is that the English who were inhabiting a small island were able to uh, choose a new element in which to orient their social, historical, and economic practices at the sea. Um, you could maybe think about that in terms of like Alf Hornberg's uh, discussion of like time space appropriation, for instance. Um, and in doing so, they're, they're able to usher in something more significant than, uh, as he says, landing in an un unknown place, but rather to institute a change in the concepts of space encompassing all levels and domains of human existence. He then, he then says that every uh, fundamental order is a spatial order. Uh, when one speaks of the constitution of a country or a piece of earth as its fundamental order, it's called its nomos. So he argues that a change in nomos brings about a new epoch in world history. And at the beginning of every great epoch, there stands a great land appropriation. So of course, the Nazis were trying to usher in a new uh, sort of global order. So it necessitates a, um, a great land appropriation. Um, so he articulates the necessary for an emergent hegemonic power, in this case, Germany, uh, in the context of historical friend-enemy relations to develop a frontier to be engaged in, quote-unquote, unexampled land appropriation. Uh, and we can sort of think of that in the same vein as uh, Jason's conception of capitalism's need to spread geographically through successive frontiers in search of seven uh, cheap things. So, right. So moving on to... Hitler, um, 
Todd Weir makes this important distinction, I think, between um, the application of the term. Uh, he, he's pushing back against this idea that everything that Hitler possibly could have thought uh, fits into his worldview, and instead makes this distinction between, I'm not going to try to pronounce the German, but uh, world picture and worldview. Um, so coming out of Timothy Snyder's book, Black Earth, The Holocaust is History and Warning, um, we get an idea, although he doesn't make the distinction, we can at least glean, glean an idea of what uh, Hitler is, uh, both his world a world picture and his worldview might look like. Um, so the world picture that Hitler was faced with uh, and Germany was faced with, um, they were faced with what they perceived of as a looming socio-ecological crisis in terms of food. Um, the Green Revolution predicated on advancements in agricultural scientists, sciences would not take place until after the Reich fell. Um, right, so. So in the style of like David Harvey and Andreas Malm, uh, Snyder describes Nazi thinking on food shortage and associated questions pertaining to investment in agro, uh, agricultural sciences or cons conquering of territory to alleviate the claustrophobia gripping, gripping Germany in terms of time, space, compression. Um, he writes, if past and future contain nothing but struggle for scarcity, all the tension fell upon the present. A psychic resolve for relief from a sense of crisis overwhelmed a practical resolve to think about the future. Rather than seeing the ecosystem as open to research and rescue, Hitler imagined that a supernatural factor, the Jews, had perverted it. Um, so his world picture revolved around a depiction of Germany in dire need of advancements in agricultural productivity. Um, and this will hold a specific meaning when contextualized within Hitler's um, socio-ecological worldview. Um, so, um, the worldview is sort of, I take it sort of a variant definition of it, um, and say that it's uh, the ideal typical worldview is a coherent, totalizing, non-contradictory system of truth, complete with ethical and political components. So Hitler's socio-ecological worldview revolves around the concept of the law of racial struggle, um, in which races were conceived like species. Um, contextualized within the, the world picture of it, that Hitler would have had, the idea of ecology was scarcity, and existence meant struggle for land took on a particular meaning. So Snyder writes that the struggle against inferior races for territory was a matter of control of parts of the Earth's surface. The struggle against the Jews was ecological since it conferred not a specific racial enemy or territory, but the, con uh, but the conditions of life on Earth. Um, so for Hitler, Jews as well as Slavs were considered to be racially inferior to Germans, and they were upsetting the natural order of humans' relations with the non-human. So under, for Hitler, normal socio-ecological conditions, strong races were supposed to star weak races into submission. But his claim in Mein Kampf is that um, Jews had found ways, uh, for instance, using universalistic ideas such as socialism, uh, to starve their superiors. Um, so this, to Hitler, was the socio-ecological problem which needed to be remedied through political implementation of his worldview. Um, so the sort of Darwinistic worldview, law of racial struggle, uh, the, the answer to it was to eliminate the Jews, subordinate the Slavs, and then the natural order of strong, starving, weak will be restored. Um, so in, in adopting this sort of um, picture of nature as totalizing truth, he, he, Hitler was sort of deliberately critiquing Cartesian logic uh, regarding the relationship between nature and society. Um, so Snyder writes that for Hitler, however, Nature was the singular, brutal, and overwhelming truth, and the whole of history of attempting to think otherwise was an illusion. Um, so now we move to uh, towards a world ecology of Lebensraum. Um, so Timothy Snyder write, uh, notes that Hitler was, in fact, a racial colonist. Um, I think there's a, co a comparison to be made with the, the United States and the land appropriation made um, yeah, on this continent. Um, so in order to uh, achieve this racial colonization of Eastern Europe, uh, the Nazi logic of not necessarily the <coughs> nation society, but a friend and enemy would organize different ontologies of racial coloni colonizer, racial colonized, German and Jew, homogeneous and heterogeneous, which would be called upon to ethically justify the externalization of their chiefs related to the construction of Lebensraum. So 
So I think it's important to deal with these questions, recognizing that um, a critique of Cartesian logic can go wrong. Um, so it's not enough just to dispense with nature and society as ontological categories, um, but there are specific ways we have to do it, right? So, and in addressing Heidegger's conception of these ontological uh, formulations, we should not be privileging the homogeneous or the, the near. We need to resist like this not in my backyardism ecology and push for a more like not in anybody's backyard ecology. Um, and in critiquing Smith, we should avoid the sort of um, elementalism and a, a specific form of deep ecology that sort of essentializes people and postulates them as um, just natural. Um, and then with Hitler, we need to avoid the sort of biological over-determinism in understanding history, like Garrett Diamond does in Guns, Germs, and Steel. Um, so there are a bunch of limitations. This is like a first crack at something I might want to write a, might want to write a dissertation on. Uh, so some limitations that I see are, um, right now this seems to be sort of a sociology of experts paper, so I need to contextualize that within literature. Um, I'd also like to see how, as um, social constructionists like uh, Berger and Luckman say, um, how did this type of expert knowledge become commonplace knowledge in Germany? How did these ecological uh, formulations become accepted? Um, I'd eventually like to uh, construct a sort of national socialist socio-ecological theory of value like Jason does for capitalism. Um, I, right, and there's this comparison that needs to be made within, uh, at least to the, the, the United States case. Um, and I was also thinking about um, the O'Connor's contradictions of capitalism and thinking about, for instance, how the Soviet Union may have um, tried to remedy the first contradiction, the contradiction between forces and relations of production, and maybe the Nazis are trying to overcome the second contradiction of capitalism, the mode of production and background conditions of production, those contradictions. And I just have some sources. Uh, thank you very much for the time.